you've got a lot to do. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little less on your mind? I'd Bailey can take the pressure off your day-to-day -day accounting, taxes, data issues, and other business needs. What inspires you inspires us. This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Eid Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Eid Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, eidbailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and Ide Bailey, LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. My name is Art Wiederman, and I am a dental division director at the CPA firm of Ide Bailey. Uh, I've been a dental CPA for 38 years and a dental practice broker here in Southern California for uh, 17 years. And one of my passions uh, in doing this podcast and doing the work that I've done is helping uh, dentists meet their personal and business financial goals. And uh, part of that is in the world of investing in the financial markets and uh, being that we are now in Believe it or not, folks, uh, you are listening to this podcast in January of 2023 or a little later, if you listen to it later. And it is impossible for me to believe that we are three, almost three years since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And our world has just been turned upside down and changed. And uh, the investment markets have been Kind of like a Coney Island roller coaster. If you don't know where Coney Island is, I grew up in Brooklyn and it's uh, right by the water. And uh, that was the first roller coaster I ever rode as a little kid. And that's what these financial markets have been like. But um, my guest today, Darren Pladson from Ide Bailey Financial Services, uh, is a very, very experienced wealth manager and knows the financial markets as well as anybody that I know. And we're going to talk about what is what is inflation doing? What's happening in China? What does the Ukraine war mean? Uh, you know, what sectors are good? What are bad? And all that kind of stuff. So we'll get to Darren in a moment. I do want to remind you to please go on to the website of our wonderful marketing partner, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. 140 incredible continuing education courses available to you at a very, very low price to get your CE done. Um, if you go onto their website, again, www.decisionsindentistry.com, uh, you will find the best clinical articles on dentistry from clinicians all over the world, the best of the best. So please go and visit uh, our Decisions in Dentistry partners. Uh, if you are, it's the beginning of the year, folks. It's time for you to think about your financial plan. I'll probably be doing a podcast, one of my fireside chats with you in the next month or two about what you should be doing. Today's going to be covering the investment and wealth wealth side of it. Um, it's a great time for you to revisit uh, your financial plan, plan your taxes out for 2023. Uh, if you don't have the best relationship with your CPA firm, please give us a call. My number is 657-279-3243. And my office uh, email is a Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N, at idbailey.com. And I, uh, before we, get, well, I'll read that uh, when I introduce Darren. Um, so uh, we have a disclaimer that we have to read, which may take the most of the time of the podcast, but we have to do that. 
Um, and uh, I, again, want to remind you, if you have not looked at the employee retention tax credit and you're eligible for 2020, uh, your time is running out. We got about five or six months before uh, that window is going to close. We've done that for over 125 dental practices in uh, all across the country. We've gotten uh, well over $5 million back in government money, and it's all legal. And again, please be careful if you get people soliciting you, trying to get you, uh, tell you that because uh, uh, your goldfish has periodontal disease, you qualify for the ERTC, or because uh, you had a social distance, or because you had trouble getting dental supplies that you qualify, uh, the federal government is coming after you. And in fact, uh, they are <laughs> they are already identifying promoters who they are going to start looking at their customer list. So be very careful about that. Be sure to check out our new I'd Bailey podcast, Ebb and Flow, a business podcast providing inspired insight on issues and trends the middle market faces. Hear unique business stories, get answers to frequently asked and unasked questions, and understand business topics that matter to you. Available now on your favorite podcast platform. All right, let me get to my guest. Uh, Darren Pladson has been on our podcast once before. He's my uh, go-to guy when it comes to this information. Uh, Darren is located out of uh, our home office in Fargo, North Dakota. Go Bison, I guess. That's North Dakota State. That's their uh, Is that right? Go Bison. I did that well. Yep. One one day I'll get to the Thunderdome for a football game. Uh, Darren is a principal and senior wealth advisor for Idebelly Financial Services. Darren, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Art. Thanks for having me. All right. So before we do this, let's get the business side of this out of the way, and I will read that. Not going to get to the investment advice for another second, but I do need to read this disclaimer. The information in this presentation is not intended to provide tax, legal, insurance, or investment advice. The information, opinions, or recommendations are solely for informational purposes, constitute the guest's best judgment, and are only valid as of the date of this presentation, and are subject to change without notice. Investment information in this presentation is not an investment recommendation or solicitation. The speaker is not advising you personally, and this presentation is not tailored to any specific person. You should consult a qualified investment advisor regarding your specific personal financial and investment decisions and consult an attorney or tax professional regarding your specific tax or legal situation. And I just got to go to this next thing to read. Uh, EB Financial Services offers investment advisory services through Ide Bailey Advisors, LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through United Planners Financial Services, member of FINRA and SIPC. Ide Bailey Financial Services, LLC, is the holding company of Ide Bailey Advisors, LLC, and EB Agency, LLC, is a wholly owned and operated under Ide Bailey, LLP. Ide Bailey, EB Financial Services, and its subsidiaries are not affiliated with United Planners. And again, the presentation is provided for informational purposes, shouldn't be construed investment advice, legal or accounting advice, and no representation is made today concerning the actual future performance of markets or economies. I'm exhausted, Darren. How about you? Oh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, th- but co- but is, compliance is happy. Well, yeah, what we want, yeah, because if compliance is not happy, then uh, bad things happen to all of us. So anyway, um, let's get going and talking about what's going on in these markets. I mean, it was a tough year. The, the S&P, and again, folks, we're recording this podcast uh, last day of November. It's going to come out middle of January. So if... Uh, Something catastrophic happens between now and then. I can't be responsible for that. But uh, as of right now, the S&P is down, Darren, about 17%. NASDAQ's about 30% down. The Dow down about 7 I mean, let, let's talk about why the markets did poorly. I mean, there's inflation and supply chain, Ukraine, China, the fact that my Los Angeles Rams are not having a good time. I mean, there's all this kind of stuff. So Maybe get into what what happened in the markets, just kind of as an overview to start the conversation. Well, or you know, you've you've uh, you've talked football twice now, so maybe we should just switch this and talk football <laughs> for the next hour. I think everybody'd be happier, you know, with with how the markets have performed, or despite how the markets have performed. So, 
Um, you know, and and I think what's interesting are uh, you you touched on, you know, really why this market's pulled back this year, and and I'll start kind of at the beginning of the year and. You know, right after the Olympics, you know, um, you know, uh, Russia went into Ukraine, um, and even prior to that, we had supply chain issues coming out of COVID, and 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 now you throw in a, a country like Ukraine, which is a a, a very large um, ag type country and a producer of of food products, and it naturally turns into an in, you know that along with other issues turn into an in, uh, an inflation problem. Um, you know, China's lingering out there. They've had on and off uh, COVID, it seems like, for the last, you know, really, like you said, two and a half years, uh, which obviously they're a big supplier of, of goods and, and products to us and the world. Um, but inflation, I think, you know, you look at the why, why has this market done what it's done? And it's the uncertainty about inflation. And that that is kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what I think is happening right now. The market hates uncertainty. And and that's what I feel is really driving, um, you know, and, and you think about it in your practice and in any type of business, if you're running at an inflation rate of 8%, I think a lot of people are scratching their heads because we're used to two and a half to 3% inflation. They're scratching their heads and saying, how long will this last? And whether, whether it's um, Apple or John's dentist, dentistry, everybody is wondering, you know, when's this going to end? And that, that's, that gets into the Fed, and we'll talk about them here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, you know, officially we are in a bear market. I mean, a bear market by definition is when you have a pullback of 20%. We've seen that in the S&P 500. <clears throat> it was down north of 20%. We've seen that in the NASDAQ. Haven't necessarily seen it in the Dow. Uh, but yes, we are in a bear market right now. So, um, you know, I think that's that's interesting. One other point to, that I'm going to probably... Uh, talk way too much about our, you know, as we're talking about rates of return this year and you hit it, you know, we're down 17 and the S and P 500 and North of 30 or right around 30 in the NASDAQ. What a lot of people don't understand is the 10 year treasury. And, and then that, that's just, if you went out and bought a 10 year treasury bond, um, let's say January 1st, and you, you held that today, uh, what's interesting is you're going to be down about 12 or 13 percent. So there, there's there hasn't really been a safe haven. We there are some uh, that have actually worked this year, uh, but you you know a lot of times you put bonds or fixed income in your portfolio to help diversify the risk in your portfolio. And you know when that's down 12, 13 percent in a portfolio, that really hurts. And I I think that's the hardest part about this market right now. And 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 talking about bonds, Darren. I mean just just the basic concept for those of you who might. Uh, be just getting started and learning about how investing works. And hopefully this podcast will give you some good information. Um, you know, if I buy a bond in January and it's yielding me 1% and now I can go out and buy a bond that's yielding me 4% 10 months later because interest rates have gone up, the value of that bond and that bond is priced every single day is going to be lower because why would someone want to buy my 1% bond when they can go buy somebody else's for 4%? So it's you know, and you're right. It's a safe haven. I heard a statistic this morning. I was listening to a uh, another financial lecture at a at a group I was in, I'm involved with. It said that um, uh, if China were to open up completely right now and just get rid of all their shutdowns, they project that there would be this is horrible. One and a half million people would lose their lives because of COVID. It's that bad. And they can't open up, which which hurts all kinds of things. And so l- let's start with the let's start with the Fed, Darren. Okay, mm-hmm. so the only thing the federal government has in their tool belt to to, to control anything regarding infl- inflation is is interest rates. They've raised interest rates at, was it four or five times? Um, many of them three quarter basis points. So we're now at what four and a half on the Fed funds rate. Uh. uh Four actually, three seven four, five oh, right, to four. four. Yep, right, yep, right. The, range. the next yep. one, yeah, the next. That's right. The next one they're talking about is going to take us potentially to four and a half, and then. So, talk about what the Fed is doing. Maybe how you mentioned a little earlier, they might have missed the boat, which a lot of people are saying, and and maybe what you think it's going to do twenty twenty three, and how does this affect the markets? Yeah. Um. So so one thing I you know we I, I mentioned inflation previous. And, and one thing I want to note is right now, um, 
according to October reading, we were actually at about 7.7, 7.8% inflation. And that's, that's a look back of 12 months. Okay. So they're always looking back 12 months on a monthly basis. Um, and that, that has come down from about, well, I think one of our readings was north of 9%. So getting back to your question, Art, and your point. So the Fed has increased rates now uh, four times. They do a range now. So 3.75 to 4%. It used to be just it was right on the number, so we'll call it 3.88%. Uh, December, it looks like another 50 basis point raise. Then after that, I'm looking at a chart right now, which they actually poll the Fed governors and where they think the top will be. And they're saying, you know, this is them, actually, the people that are voting on this. They're saying their high should be right around 45 4.6%. Um, and their long-term range will be at 2.5%. Now, now think logically of what and why the Fed is doing this. First, first the why. Uh, the Fed is looking at, and they're really mandated by two parts. One is um, inflation, curb inflation, and the other is employment and curb employment, right? Well, we know employment um, is, is south of 4% or lower than 4% right now, 3.8, 3.9%. They've got that covered. It's the inflation part that is worrying, like I said, everybody, including the Fed. The Fed will only increase rates if they feel the economy is solid. And, and that's what I think is so interesting. The Fed's increasing, right? And they're, they're saying that, hey, business, generally speaking, and the consumer, generally speaking, is pretty well off. So we feel we can raise rates up to a certain level to try to curb inflation. Now, what, what could happen is they could put us into a recession, right? Just by doing this. But they also understand that if they put us into a recession, they can then cut rates relatively quick. You can't cut rates if you're at zero, right? And that's, right. <laughs> that's where we started. And, and, that, and so that's where I think it's interesting. Um, kind of long-winded answer to your, to your question, but I do believe we're going to see a 50 basis point increase. December, not a lot after that. I could see them doing a couple 25 basis uh, basis point increases sometime throughout the year. I, I could see them pausing um, at their next meeting. I believe it's, it, I'm pretty sure it's December and then January, uh, maybe not doing anything. So, um, and a lot of it too is is the stock market and how, and if we see any type of recovery and if we're starting to continue get, to get good readings where inflation is continuing to come down a little bit. And, and, you know, I, I go back and you and I have talked about this. We talked about this the last time I had you on the on the show is the bottom line, folks, is that stocks are priced based on earnings. If a company is doing well, its stock should go up. And if a company is not doing well, its stock should go down. And right now, the S&P's uh, P.E. is right around about is about about 17, I think. Is that yep. about right? Right on. Yep. And, and how does that fit with a a good economy, a weak economy for stocks? I mean, obviously, you know, PE ratios, uh, the higher they are, maybe the better that is for stocks. Um. Yeah, and it, you know, it's just a factor. It's P divided by price of the stock divided by earnings of the stock, and and then you can look at the PE of the the whole S and P five hundred as well. So, and and are you hit it? You know, it, right now we're at seventeen. The historical average is about sixteen point five as an average. As PEs go up, that'll tell you maybe stocks are overpriced, and when PEs come down, they're they're underpriced, and usually. You know, if you if you ever listen to Warren Buffett, you know, the greatest investor of all time, he looks for things on sale and and you go to Walmart versus shopping somewhere else. Everything's on sale. So um, so th so that that's what's interesting. Now, we've seen P.E.s a little bit lower that recently over the last month, month and a half. They've they've jumped up a little bit. Um, but again, I, I look at this and say, um you know, companies I think are still doing okay. We're you know we're getting beat up in in the tech world, and we're seeing some layoffs there and and some other stuff. But uh, generally speaking, um, yeah, we're we're at a normalized rate. And we'll talk about international markets because that's interesting. The the PE of of let's say developed international um, is really low right now. So again, probably the best value. However, we have we have home field bias here too, where people tend to invest in the U.S. more than internationally. Right. But there's lots of opportunities and we'll get to that. I remember the, the one thing I remember about Warren Buffett that he said, uh, someone asked him, uh, so, you know, what, what stocks do you buy? And his comment was, what I do is I look at a company, I go to their corporate office, I close my eyes, I stand in front of their corporate office 
And I think, is this a product that everybody wants to buy? And if the answer is yes, I buy the stock. Pretty simple, huh? Yeah, very simple. I, I mean, yep. he talks about that and stuff. So there's this other thing that I've been looking at, and I know you look at it on a regular basis, as do the people at iBailey. Uh, financial services is a yield curve. And so, folks, just to, to tee up Darren to talk about this is, you know, theoretically, if you borrow, I mean, if if you go out and buy a bond, all right, what whatever bond it's going to be, um, theoretically, the shorter the term of the bond, the less the return you're going to get. In other words, if you're going to lend either a government entity or a company money uh, and you lend them that money for a year, they theoretically are going to pay you less interest than if you lend it to them for 10 years or 30 years. Well, Darren, it's kind of not working that way, is it? I mean, so yeah. talk about what is a yield curve? Why is it important? And, you know, and we have some inverted yield. Curve. I think there's like 90 different ways to look at a yield curve. If you really, yeah, you know, and we're not going to do that today. I promise we're not going to look at 90 ways to look at a yield curve. But um, what's a yield curve and, and what does it mean to these markets? Yeah. Um, so all the yield curve is, if you think of just graphing something out on the x-axis or the, the horizontal axis, you just have years, okay? And you go from three months, one year, two year, all the way out to 30 years, okay? Um, from left to right. And then you you put the yield, what's what's the going yield on the left hand or the vertical column? Um, and it, like Art said, um, the normal yield curve, it's just going to, it's going to have a nice slope to it, lower on the left, higher on the right. Um, what's interesting is right now is the Fed, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, but as the Fed is increasing rates, there's a direct, because really what that rate is, it's overnight lending from bank to bank. Um, so if bank XYZ needs funds, they can go to bank ABC down the block, say, Hey, I need a, you know, a hundred million dollars that's the going rate, or they can go to the, the Federal Reserve as well and borrow at that rate. Um, so what happens is they, they're pushing up short term, especially, you know, anything from three months to two year rates right now. And that is a high correlation to what the Fed's doing. When you get out on the yield curve, it, it becomes more supply demand driven. So what, what you are doing or, or the consumer is doing, are we buying more or less of, of that yield? And that, that will direct from say five year all the way up to 30 year. Um, when you have an inverted yield curve, there are, there's a lot of data that shows a recession is coming. And, um, and, and we can blame the Fed for this, right? Just from what I, I just explained, the Fed's pushing up short-term rates, the long-term long -term rates aren't following, it's, it's pointing to a recession. Now, uh, there have been false signals in the past uh, but people that do read yield curves every day, and I, I look at yield curves frequently, um, um, really, are, are, everybody's kind of coming to the same conclusion that, yes, we're probably going into a recession. I, I think it's, and we can talk about this at a, on another question, but um, I, I think the, re the recession is going to be kind of a movable recession. I don't see any one sector um, that's going to necessarily pull the whole whole market down. And by the way, we can be in a recession. Um, and the market can actually still go up, right? And a lot of times it will do that by the time we, we tell people we're in a recession, which is delayed data, um, we might be coming out of it, right? From a, from a stock market standpoint. But go ahead. yeah, no, I was just going to say, what, what's important about a yield curve though is right now, and, and Art, you touched on this, if you're buying bonds, right? Spe specifically bonds, you want to stay short. You know, that's where the best yield is right now. I'm, I'm looking at one right now on the, on the one year yield, you know, at 4.46 versus the, the 20 year at, at 3.97. Obviously you want to stay short. Right. And, and, you know, when it comes to bonds, somebody also explained to me, so, and, and tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. If I look at my bond portfolio, and maybe I have a bunch of bonds that are down. I mean, you said 12, 13% down because obviously interest rates have gone up and the, the, the pricing of the bond goes down. But at the end of the day, when those bonds cash in, they're all going to cash in at par, right? Correct. Yep. So, so if I have a portfolio of bonds, and again, we're not getting specific here, a portfolio of bonds, and you know, I, I started out with $100,000 in January, and now I have... Uh, 88,000. I mean, is it right to think as an investor that I have $100,000 in my portfolio? Yeah, as long as you don't have default uh, default well, risk. Well, right. Obviously. You know, I mean, that's, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it will, 
naturally come back to par because that's that's the deal you have with the U.S. government or Coca-Cola or or whoever, whatever bond, whatever name you've got. Uh, that's the deal. They they owe you that money unless, of course, they default. So, yep. All right. So you talked about, we, you mentioned sectors. And again, everybody, we've got, there's, I think, what, 12 or 13 different sectors of the economy that that financial advisors look at. Um, the only one that went up in 2022, gee, shock, surprise, is energy. Um, yeah, I, I love how they say on the national news, the average price of gas is $3.60. They should come to California. Uh, it has come down. We're down under $6 a gallon right now, but energy obviously did very, very well. So all the other sectors, and especially tech, and also, Darren, in 2021, a lot when the market did well, a lot of what carried these markets were the big five or six or seven tech companies that did really well, and they're getting ha- hammered, right? The tech is getting hammered this year, right? Yep. Yeah, and you know, I just looked the other day, actually, um, and you know, some people call them the Fang stocks, right? Facebook, now they're Meta, Apple, right. Amazon, Netflix, Google, the big five, and right. and you you think of you know the the market makeup of of those five and the percent, um, their market cap weighting on in just the S and P 500, they make up north of like 25 or almost, I think it's 28%. I should have looked that up, but it's a big percent. So when those five, uh, don't do well, um, and and to give you an example, meta Facebook, um, is down, I think somewhere around 50, 60% year to date. And, And then you have, um, Amazon down 30, I think I'm, these are off the top of my head. I just looked the sure, other day and I can't, sure, sure. and, and same with Google down 25, 30%. Those are the big drivers of, you know, we, we just look at the S and P 500. Well, they're making up 25% of it. So, um, so anyway, that, that, yes, you're right. Tech, you know, I'm looking at right now, uh, through, uh, this is actually through yesterday. So to end of November, uh, down 24%. You're right. Energy as a sector up 67%. Yeah, it, it, I saw that this morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, so you, you have three main sectors that are really bad and the other one's actually not that bad. You know, I mean, and, and there are 11 sectors, by the way, Art. So oh, 11. Uh, I, I was, I, listen, I, I get a 10% one way or another yep, standard yep, exactly. deviation. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so uh, what sectors, Darren, I mean, uh, again, we're not giving specific investment advice here, but are there some sectors that you're for 2023, you know, maybe this is a better thought or this one might have some issues? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, if you think about it, if if we go into a recession and if it is a soft recession, let's say first, second quarter of next year, you want to be in what are called kind of defensive sectors. So you look at utilities, you look at healthcare, uh, sure. consumer staples, um, kind of the stuff that, you know, and I, I'm looking at those year to date returns right now and actually consumer staples up 0.7%, utilities up 0.3 year to date, um, healthcare is down 2%. These are kind of the safety sectors. So, and I, I can't give advice obviously here, but no. you know, no. if I'm a betting person, you stay kind of defensive, uh, for the first part of the year at some point, um, you'll, we'll see tech back, you know, and we'll see, um, consumer discretionary back and com- communication services, uh, they'll, they'll, you know, everything rotates. And, um, but what is interesting, those three that I just mentioned have driven the market kind of single-handedly over the last eight, nine years, 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, you know, again, everything will rotate here. Which is why diversification is so important, which we'll ch- uh, chat about in a moment. Let's take a, a, a quick break. I want to let everybody know, um, Darren, maybe tell us a little bit about what you guys do at Ide Bailey Financial Services. Uh, and, and folks, I'm going to tell you, the, the foundation of any good investment, wealth, financial advisor always starts with a financial plan. And I've been harping on this. Uh, We are now, by the way, four years into this podcast and the thousands of people that download our podcast every month. Thank you so much for the honor and privilege of your time. I came and tell you how much I appreciate and how much I love doing this and sharing information and hopefully helping to change some lives because that's my legacy, folks. And um, but the, the number one thing is a financial plan. And Darren, talk a little bit about why the just let's get briefly on this. You guys always start you know, with a financial plan, you don't start with, okay, send me your portfolio and we'll rebalance it for you. It always starts with 
what's the plan? And then, you know, just a little bit about the process of what you guys do in managing money. Yeah. So you, you hit the nail on the head, Art. I, you know, I can't give anybody any advice unless I know a lot about my client. And that, that, you know, that comes down to the financial plan, uh, where their net worth is, what they want, what are their goals, what are their dreams. Um, and, and that's that's where everything starts from that point. And once we get a good handle on that and we've presented the kind of the final product, then we can make recommendations and how we're going to build a portfolio. Uh, we do manage assets. We are financial advisors. Um, we manage um, we are factor investors, which a lot of people have never heard of that word. All a factor is is our definition is it's a source of premium. And so we look at academics uh, that have won Nobel Prizes. And uh, we buy into their research and their data. So as, as one factor, I'll give you a, one example because there's numerous uh, examples of factors, but typically value type of, of, of stocks outperform growth stocks. And this goes back to the 50s and all the data, and it, and it, end, it ends up where it, they typically outperform about 60% uh, percent of the time. That's just one factor, but but that's what we do. We tilt portfolios. It doesn't mean we're all value. We do have growthy uh, type of names in our portfolios as well. So that's, yeah. that's really what we do, Art. Okay. And give out your name. Give it. Well, we know your name. Your name is Darren. So yeah. uh, Darren Pledson, give out your phone number and email. How can people get a hold of you? And then we'll go back to talking about the markets. Sure. I'm, I'm at 701-476-8767 six, seven is my direct line. And then my email is, uh, D Pladson, D P L A D S O N at I com E I D E B A I L L Y.com. Yeah. And, and folks, if you have just a question, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're not sure what you're doing with your money. You don't have a financial advisor. You get 12 envelopes every year with your, um, you know, with your year month end balances, you never open them. And now you're saying, well, geez, I'm getting towards retirement. Maybe I should start thinking about this. Darren, you'd be happy to answer questions for any of our listeners, right? Yep, absolutely. Sounds good. All right, so you mentioned uh, uh, growth and value, and that's a big deal. And people, you and I both know in, in the conversations we've had and just the the education that we have is that, you know, when times get tough and markets are rough, I guess that rhymes, um, people tend to go to value. They go to the utilities. They go to the staples of the world. I don't mean staples, the company. I mean the um, consumables, things that we know that people are going to go out and buy soap and they're going to go out and buy milk and they're going to go out and buy toilet paper and things like that. Um, So talk about what is the difference between a growth stock and a value stock and how does that work in a recession? Yeah, and and so... um, I'll throw out a couple definitions and the historical definition of value versus growth um, is we would categorize value as say a 3M, right? Um, Something that's paying a good high dividend. However, the way we look at value is something that's just undervalued, right? So I I touched on um, PEs being 16 uh, in the S and P 500 or excuse me, 17 in the average of, 25 year average of being 16. Well, what if there's a company out there that has a PE of 12? That's an undervalued stock. And that, that name could be um, Tesla, right? It, in theory. And, and so therefore that would qualify as a value type of name, the way we look at it. So, and that's how Warren Buffett looks at value as well. What's on sale, what's cheap. Um, you know, what's interesting art too, is I, I'm, I'm looking at year to date returns. I've got this pretty neat, I'll call it a, a one-sided Rubik's cube or a three by three uh, bar. And it goes from value blended to growth across uh, again, the top or the X axis. And then the Y axis is small, mid and large. And when I look at the value boxes relative to growth this year, um, grossly outperformed, you know, and so we're, we're receiving that or we're the recipro- reciprocant of our portfolios doing very well uh, this year because we do have that tilt right now. I, it's not perfect because growth, quite frankly, over the last 10 years and not every month over the last 10 years, but on a, on a 10 year average growth has, has really outperformed uh, value. Basically, you know, I go back to those Fang names, right? Because they've been so strong um, and performed so well. But again, right now in our world, 
uh, today, and especially year to date, value has has outperformed pretty substantially relative to growth. And that's we've actually seen that. You go back to oh about August of 2021, and we started seeing things start to kind of turn ahead of time. So. And and most of these value stocks, are there more value stocks that pay dividends and less growth stocks that pay dividends? Because I know that high dividend paying stocks are very popular right now. Uh, and that's where a lot of people are putting their money is the safety part right now. Yeah. And that's a great point. Yes. To answer your question, that is typically true. Not all the time, but typically, you know, you think of um, a high dividend payer versus a low dividend payer. Actually, that's a factor um, where Typically, high dividend payers will outperform low dividend payers, um, again, roughly 60% of the time. And, and again, that's just another factor. It's a source of premium. Uh, but yeah, people, you know, and, and, and there, are, there are people that that's all they look at is are dividend payers, and that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad, like, say, the last 10 years when the, where the low dividend payers have actually performed very well, again, like a Tesla or like an Apple or... Um, and, and Apple's dividend's not terrible, but it's you, you're kind of getting my point here, right? Of course, and 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 it's, uh, but the the important thing, folks, is that you need to be, and and I have harped on this for four years. Okay, nobody is going to watch your money as well as you are a good, competent financial advisor. So if you are just saying well, I really don't know what's going on and I don't really understand it. Folks, you need to be reading. You need to be working with someone who does understand it and can help you with your goals and stuff like that. And uh, because, you know, if if you don't, your money's just going to flounder. And I mean, we, we, we had one client we found that had, uh, they didn't even realize they had $2 million in a money market fund for 10 years. And then I looked at this thing, I said, Really? Yeah, well, I just I just didn't do anything. With, you know, so you, you need to be looking at this stuff. Let's hit a bunch of other stuff. How about the housing market? How does that affect the markets? I know housing is is it's crazy. Now interest rates are at seven percent to buy a house. When I bought my first house, my wife and I in nineteen eighty six, uh our interest rate was sixteen percent. So it's all crazy, but but how does the housing market affect the, the markets? Yeah, and and you know, go. I'll go back to the Fed, right? And Jay Powell, um, you know, they're they're increasing rates, which there's a high correlation to mortgage rates and what they're doing here, right? So as they're increasing rates, they're trying to calm the housing market down. I mean, we've seen 2001 and two, or 2021 um, and 2020, um, just such a crazy housing market all throughout the country. Whether you're in California or New York or Florida or North Dakota, it it's just been kind of out of control. Um, and a lot of this stems from COVID. Um, you know, I, I remember going into 2020, um, <clears throat> there was, we were, we had a housing shortage of about a million units, uh, that the, the builders just weren't building a uh, little uncertainty and then COVID hits and it, it just, it's a pile on effect, right? So we go from a million to a million five of, of houses being short. And then all of a sudden we'll call it some normalcy. And then, uh, Rates are extremely low and prices will go up, right? When you have a shortage like that. And that's what we saw. Now, you know, we're starting to see uh, little bits and pieces where housing prices are starting to come down because the consumer or interest rates have taken a lot of consumers out of the market, just kind of pricing out of the market. So um, now we haven't seen big movements yet. And I, I do think we're going to see some settling down of this housing market um, to a point where, you know, houses will be longer on the market or take more time to sell um, and, and, and things like that, especially if rates stay in this 7%. And again, kind of your point, Art, you know, you started at 16%, 7%, I believe, I, I thought I saw something the other day, it's about the national, or it's been about the 40 year average, you know, yeah. so we, we've been so fortunate over the last eight, 10 years of extremely low rates. Um, and now we're at seven and people think the world's coming to an end. And that, that's not the, the case. At oh, all. no. But, and, and it's actually, Darren, it's actually healthy, isn't it? Talk about this. Yeah. You know, we've had a bull market for the last decade, for the most part. We had one or two years that were down. But for the most part, this these markets have gone up for the last 10 years. And uh, I mean, but, you know, and then people, oh, my God, oh, my investments are down. Oh, I'm going to fire my investment advisor because he's doing a terrible job. No, 
folks. Here's the deal. It's unhealthy if markets go up and up and up because when they come crashing down, they come crashing down. Is is that right, Darren? Yeah, you're you're spot on. Uh, you know, we could go back to 2009 even, or right. So now we're talking 13, 14 years of a of a pretty solid, well, 12 years um, of a solid bull market, right? And 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 markets have to correct themselves, and it kind of goes back to the sector um, discussion we we're having, where where one sector or or three sectors will take over the market and it'll dominate, and then everything will ebb and flow, right? And it, it's kind of the equalization process. So when when we do have a pullback, and, and this, by the way, 17% down is nowhere near what we saw to 2020 when COVID hit. We saw 35, 38% pullback in six weeks. Yep. Um, and then 2008, we saw, you know, 45% About pullback 40 over, yep. over a year. You know, so we, you know, this, this is normal um, and natural. Um, you know, I'll throw another stat out at you. I think over the last 45 years, the intra-year pullback from like peak to trough is on average about 14%, but yet the market still goes up about 70% of the time. So pullbacks are very common and they're natural and they do happen within years, you know, from again, with intra-year. Um, and, and, you know, the, the real basic concept of why you should invest, it's really, if you, if you skin this out, it's to beat the bank. And so, but you got to have time. You got to have patience. You can't make rash decisions, you know, over over an eleven month or twelve month time period. No, abs- absolutely not. All right, let's talk about the international markets. Those are really interesting right now. And it's funny. I, from what I'm seeing, there are some real opportunities in some of these international markets, aren't they? Talk about what's happening in the international markets and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, and I, I've touched on PE or we've touched on PE ratios. Uh, to give you an example, a look at uh, developed international. Okay, so I'm not talking emerging markets. Emerging markets are the BRIC countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, but developed would be um, would be England and France and Germany and and Canada and those types. So international. To give you an example, the 13 year average, or excuse me, the 20 year average PE ratio is right around 13. Currently, we're at about a 12. Okay, so that's telling us it's undervalued. Uh, there are a lot of people, including Charles Schwab, who we do a lot of our custodial work with, uh, that they say right now the best buy, and it, it's pretty obvious, is in the international world now. You got to be a little careful. I mentioned you have you have home state bias, right? Which, living in the U.S., we typically tilt our portfolios to U.S. Uh, domiciled companies, uh, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't have some international. And and, and this gets back in, into like a talk of diversification too. But but yeah, from a valuation standpoint, international looks uh, very interesting right now. Uh, even emerging markets as well. I mean, they're, they've been really beat up. And, and again, the, the valuations are cheap. Now, again, some of those names, Russia, China, that I mentioned, um, you know, maybe a little scary for some, but we, we put them in our portfolio. We always have international and emerging markets when we're building portfolios, just because we believe you got you to gotta hold them just in case. And, and you know what's interesting? I was listening again to another presentation and they were talking about the fact that that and again, folks, uh, you know, I, I I'm as much of an environmentalist as anybody, but because of this war in Ukraine, uh, coal has become king again in in foreign countries. I mean, they said that they're they're reopening or opening 250 new coal plants in India and uh, China. So, you know, that's an opera. I mean, as horrible as that is for our environment, and that's not what this podcast is about, but it is horrible for our environment. Is that not an opportunity? Yeah, you know, I, I think so. And and that's where, you know, and, and, and we could even go back and you look historically when there's a war, what happens in, in that part of the region? Typically, once it's over, uh, the market rallies. and And that's where, you know, there's, all of a sudden an excess of jobs or, or a need for jobs for rebuilding and for, you know, making clothes and making, you know, obviously Ukraine's a big, um, like I said, egg country, um, you know, outputting food and all this other stuff. So, uh, you know, usually that, that does happen at the end of a war, 
Um, usually markets will rally, especially in those regions. And um, yeah, so I, I think there's always opportunity. I'm looking at another chart right now um, and I'm looking at this and, and, and all it's showing is basically when the U.S. outperforms and then when the international developed outperforms and the U.S. has outperformed now for 15 years. And usually on average, these these outperformance last about six or seven years. And then, you know, you go back to 01 to about 2007, 08 and international outperformed. So again, it, it goes from from U.S. to international to U.S. to international to U.S. to international. Um, I, I think one of these years, it'll be international's time to really outperform or, or develop international anyway. And that brings me to maybe the most important point that I want to make in this podcast, which is diversification. I mean, I get people, Darren, that say to me, you know, Art, you know, I, I'm just going to put everything in an S&P 500 index fund. And if you do that, all you have to do every day is turn on your stocks app of your of your phone and look at what the S&P did. And that's how your how your portfolio did. But, uh, you know, that that does give you diversification, but that's large cap stocks only. Or I'm going to invest in the Dow or I'm going to invest in uh, the Russell 2000. I mean, whatever it is. But talk about and this. This is this is so important, folks, is the markets in general have yielded. If you read literature from all over the place. Over the last hundred years, the average yield on investing in the markets, if you are diversified, is, is somewhere between seven and nine percent. That's what I've read. And Darren, feel free to disagree with me. You get one disagreement in every podcast that's in our contract. So just so you know. And but talk about diversification. Why is that important? How do you guys diversify in, in your portfolios? Yeah. So I'll go back to financial planning art and you know, one of the things, um, the first question we have to figure out is what's what's our mix of stocks to bonds, right? Are you a 60-40 uh, investor? Are you an 80-20 or a 40-60? That's the biggest question. And then from that point, that's when you start building out the portfolio. Um, and, and to give you an example, usually our portfolios, once we build them, we use a lot of exchange traded funds uh, within our portfolio um, with with anybody's portfolio. And usually if we cut out all the ETFs or mutual funds that we're holding, you're going to have around 20,000, 25,000 different securities uh, within it. Now, that, that, that's great. And it's, it's extremely diversified. Um, and and I, I think I, the important part is you're going to own international uh, emerging markets, of course, U.S. And, and then you're going to get into the fixed income world. Uh, we, we actually put alternatives in a portfolio as well. And matter of fact, that's been one of our best performing, we call them sleeves or, or areas of the market this year. And, and of course, mainly because of energy. But um, so anyway, diversification is key. Everybody preaches that uh, there is a, a right and a wrong way to diversify. But yes, just buying the S&P 500 is not true diversification. You're getting representation of only the U.S. and the 500 largest companies in the U.S. And, and that's you know, again, I, I go back to the top five make up 25, 30 percent of of that whole index. So talking about a portfolio, I mean, a lot of a lot of how a any financial advisor, wealth manager structures a portfolio, Darren, really has to do with the with the client's risk tolerance. If someone is so adverse to risk, you know, you're not going to put a lot of their money into stocks that are more volatile. And if they like risk, you might put more stocks in. I mean, you know, folks, if, if you don't want volatility, I don't know, buy an annuity. I mean, and I'm not recommending annuities and Darren's not recommending annuities, but, you know, and that's a whole nother podcast, which we're going to probably do here down the road. But, you know, if, if, if you are willing to understand the risk of the stock market, the fact that markets go up and they go down, okay? And you can handle the day-to-day -day up and down. Uh, the, the markets have done people and made people trillions and trillions of dollars over the last hundred years. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, absolutely. And, and again, I, I think I've said this before, you you invest in the stock market really to beat the bank, right? And that's, right. that is, you know, you, you have money, we, we have money, and you're willing to take 
money, put money at risk in order to get a better than the bank type of return. That's, that's simply one of the reasons you do it. And, and so, um, yeah, markets go up, markets go down. We understand that I do anyway. And, you know, one of our jobs as financial advisors is really to keep our clients in the seat, you know, don't make any bad mistakes at the wrong time, uh, which can really hurt people. Yeah. And, and, you know, people, I, I've talked to many people that they can time the market and they're watching and they're, uh, you know, if, if Jim Cramer says to buy, then I'm going to buy. I mean, they're trying to time the market, right? And nothing against Jim Cramer. He's very entertaining to listen to and he's a very smart guy. But, um, uh, you know, people are thinking recession, 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 and they sell because they sell out of fear. I mean, talk about people and timing the markets and why maybe that's not such a good thing. Well, there's two parts of timing, right? You, you time it to get out and you time it to buy, you know? And yeah. so that's, you, you got to hit it right twice. And so, um, and, and, you know, there's all kinds of studies and anybody can Google, you know, the, the percentage of active managers that actually time the market. And it's a very, very low percentage that can consistently do it. You can do it in one year, right? You can't consistently, you can't repeat it over a five or a 10 year time period with great consistency. And that's where, you know what, diversify, um, hang on in, in markets like this. And that's not great advice, but I, I mean, it, it is the best advice where you just got to kind of uh, stick it out. And I, you know, I, I tell my clients this quite a bit. The time we need to have a serious discussion about adjusting your portfolio from a stock to bond mix is when is the day you stop sleeping at night. And that's, that's a, like I say that with all seriousness, um, I can't, your health is more important than your money, right? Yes. If you're not here, obviously your money doesn't mean anything. Uh, but if you're not sleeping because you're worried, then we got to make changes in your portfolio. Otherwise, kind of leave it up to me or your financial advisor to to just, you know, muddle through this right now. And and so I think that's that's important. You know, again, the, the timing issue um yeah, you're you're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win um, when you try to time the market. It just it's it's proven it just doesn't work. And and again, thousands and thousands of financial advisors, including Darren, uh, it, it are all about you know long term investing. And folks, if you do not have any, a type of retirement plan in your dental practice and you have disposable income. Uh, folks, you're missing the boat. Every single year that you don't invest in a tax-deductible retirement plan contribution and money growing on a tax-deferred basis, I mean, the amount of wealth that you build by trying to do it on your own after paying taxes in a personal stock or bond portfolio versus doing it inside of a qualified retirement plan, which is protected from creditors. Um, I, I, I mean, th the numbers are mind boggling how much more wealth you can you can uh, grow. So if you don't have it, if you're not maximizing your retirement plan contributions every year, I, I mean, I will I will continue to harp on this until they kick me off of this microphone, uh, which might be any day now. Who knows? I hope not. But uh, but but anyway, and then the other thing, doctors, I want to make a point about, and, and Darren's information is just so invaluable, and I love every time I talk to him, I learn something new, is we are in an inflationary time, okay? And what that means is that I, I talked to a doctor the other day who said, for 25 years, Art, I could, like clockwork, find employees that I could pay between $20 and $25 an hour. Now I can't find anybody by who will accept less than $35 an hour. And I hear lots of doctors saying to me, my team is all, they're all coming to me. They need raises, their rents are going up, their food is going up. And, but if your practice has 70% of your patients contracted with insurance plans, uh, you cannot raise your fees on 70% of your business. So think about it. All your costs go up. When the supermarkets costs go up, what do they do? They raise the price of a loaf of bread. They raise the price of a dozen eggs. They raise the price of a gallon of milk. So every business, when the prices, when the costs go up, they raise prices. That's why we have inflation. That's what we have right now. But if 70% of your dental practice is contracted PPOs, you can't do that. So I would encourage you 
for lots of reasons, which we've talked about on this podcast, to look at your relationship with insurance company and network plans and think about making some changes. And that has nothing to do with how you invest your money, but that is important. You'll make more money, which will mean you'll have more money to invest and diversify and all that stuff. Darren, I think we hit most of the high points. Any kind of final comments you want to make? And I want to give, give you an opportunity one more time to give out your contact information and, and stuff. Any Anything? I think we hit all the high points or did we miss anything? No. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Um, Art, and I, you know, I, I, you, you've said it a, a lot. I've, I say it a lot. You know, I think the key to a good, uh, healthy financial, um, I, I think, confidence is get a financial plan. Talk to your financial advisor. That's first and foremost. Get get your house in order. Um, I think that's really the key here. And and again, my number is 701-476-8767, and it's dpladson at idbailey.com. Um, is where I'm at if anybody has any questions. Yeah, and it's January, so a great time to come to Fargo? Um, I would stay away. <laughs> uh, Jan- January could be the worst month <laughs> ever. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I I, I was in, um, we're recording this on November 30th, so I, I'm a football, I, I love sports, and I flew 2,000 miles uh, the day after Thanksgiving, Um to go see the Ohio State Michigan football game, and it got down to 28 degrees, and I thought I was going to explode. But uh, that's why you bring layers. So Far- Fargo, you know, when I say 28 degrees, that's a heat wave to you in Fargo in in uh, November, right? Uh, oh yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> there you go, Darren Pladsen from Ide Bailey Financial Services. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And hang on with me as I take the podcast out. And folks, uh, again. Uh, Thank you for the honor and privilege of your time. It's the beginning of 2023. Start making a financial plan. I mean, financial planning involves all different aspects of your personal financial situation. It's debt management, it's taxes, it's insurance, investments, uh, investments, which we talked about today, uh, retirement, college planning, and estate planning. Those are the seven areas of financial planning that we always take a look at. And it's something that you really need to do. It's, you know, you, you go to the doctor once a year for a um, for a, an annual physical. You should be going to your financial planner well, probably more than once a year to kind of see how you're doing. I want to thank, again, my wonderful partner, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. Uh, 140 amazing continuing education classes at a very, very reasonable price. Go to www.decisionsindentistry.com. Uh, my mothership and my all, all my friends, the Academy of Dental CPAs, www.adcpa.org. Um, we are the, I was one of the founding members of this group 22 years ago. They got me through a lot of good and bad times in this economy. And um, we, we at I Bailey work with uh, about I think we're at about a thousand dentists. We work with about 300 of them in our uh, office in Orange County. My partner is Don uh, Watson and Pam Chamberlain. I'm actually not a partner. I'm kind of on the uh, non-partner. I do consulting and podcasts and webinars and all the stuff that I really like doing. Uh, But our team in Tustin is second to none. And we have great, great folks across the country to help you. Uh, And again, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm at... um, 657-279-3243 657-279-3243 or shoot me an email at awiederman at idbailey.com. Well, folks, that is it for this episode of The Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman. Again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, all of you who listen, all of you who email me and call in and who definitely um, we hope have benefited from this podcast over the last four years. We've got a lot of great guests coming up, a lot of my insight, and we're excited about 2023. It's going to be a challenging year. It's going to be a challenging year with our economy. It's going to be a challenging year in our markets. But promise me, doctors, that you will continue to work not only just in your business, but on your business. Look at your metrics. Work with a coach. Look at your numbers. We can help you with all of that. And with that, uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful 2023. Uh, I am Art Wiederman on behalf of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Bye-bye. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A W I E D E R M A N at E I D E B A I L L Y dot com. Or you may call Art at 657 279 3243.